How are you that guys this morning? Fine? Just fine? Wonderful? I have a customer whenever I go do work there. <laughs> Every time I walk in, how are you, Deb? I'm fine. Always just fine. And uh, makes me think of this song. That uh, just, like, what does that word fine, like, what does that mean? It's just, it's a word we use to say that we're okay, but we're not okay, because we don't want to go into detail, pretty much. So, uh, <clears throat> it reminds me of the Casting Crown song, um, Stained Glass Masquerade, where it says, are we happy plastic people in a shiny plastic steeple, where we just walk around with this mask on all day. I'm fine, I'm fine, but are we? And then this next song really brings to light what, uh, what's going on in a lot of our lives, our church family, church body, social media. I mean, um, it's called Truth Be Told. And uh, yeah, truth, truth is rarely told. <laughs> so let's uh, be vulnerable and honest and expose it. And uh, yeah. Lie number one, you're supposed to have it all together. But when they ask you how you're doing, you just smile and tell them you're never better. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds, your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. Truth be told, the truth is rarely told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, let's say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it. When being honest is the only way to fix it There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know So let the truth be told There's a sign on the door, it says come as you are, but I doubt it Cause if we live like that were true, every Sunday morning pew would be crowded. But didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred and the prodigal like me. Truth be told. The truth is rarely told Am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not I'm broken, and when it's out of control It's under control, but it's not And you know it I don't know why it's so hard to admit it when being honest is the only way to fix it There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know So let the truth be told Can I really stand here unashamed Knowing that your love for me won't change Oh God, if that's really true then let the truth be told I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not I'm 
broken and when it's out of control I say it's under control but it's not and you know it I don't know why it's so hard to admit it when being honest is the only way to fix it there's no failure no fall there's no sin you don't already know yeah I know there's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the everlasting. Amen.
Psalm 62, five to eight. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge.
so good. <laughs> and I just think of forever, for endless days, singing your praise. <laughs> and I'm just so overwhelmed. <laughs> All I can say is, God, you are so good, and we love you, and we praise you. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day that we can be together. Thank you for just the wonderful uh, weather that you've been giving us, the warm weather, and just for the sunshine of this season. But Lord, as we come together this morning and we're, 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 we want to look into what you would teach us this morning, and as we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching this morning, um, I ask that you would just uh, come into our hearts, that you would reveal to us more about ourselves maybe, that you would have more hold of us, that we would be able to give more over to you that we would submit our lives to you. Lord, I ask that you would just uh, teach us. As John already asked of you, Lord, I ask it again that the, the things that come out of my mouth uh, would be edifying to you, give glory to you, that it would be um, encouraging. But Lord, that what we would hear would be from you and not just from me. That the, the words that, um, that don't matter, may they fall away, Lord. May you be glorified and lifted up. So I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So as I was, um, as you know, I'm getting ready for this trip, and uh, uh, as time is going on, the summer's here, and. Um, from my understanding of what's going on in our world, uh, I think it sounds like COVID-19 is finally starting to like kind of go away a little bit. Now, I say that with very cautiously. <laughs> um, and we do know that there are still people in our communities that are affected and have died and have died recently from COVID-19. Um, but it's nice because at least the states are starting to open up a little more. They're getting a little more relaxed about a couple of things, and that's really nice. I'm really excited about that, um, and I'm really glad for that. And it kind of feels like maybe we can get back to a little bit of normalcy, whatever that is, right? I mean, we've all been affected in one way or another by uh, COVID-19 itself or by how the states have handled it, or our government, or um, yeah, just how family members have handled it, all of that. And, it, and to me, it, with it dwindling down a little bit at least, it seems like maybe we can just get back to life a little bit for once. And yet, when I think about that, I'm, asking, I'm starting to ask these questions of like, okay, so what does that look like to get back to life? Does it mean just going back to the way things were pre-COVID, you know? Or um, do, we, do we look at, you know, what, what, was life actually better back then? I mean, we, certain situations were, but was, when it comes down to it, in our hearts, in our heart of hearts, was I more fulfilled back then, given the situation, with my life, than I am now, or not? What was so different about it? And so I'm asking these questions. What does it mean to live life? What does it mean to live life to the fullest? And that kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, as we look forward to more of uh, COVID regulations being taken off and maybe going on a, a trip uh, and maybe just enjoying weather outside and the, all the events of summer and all of those kinds of things, what does it mean to actually live life to the fullest? And was I really living life any differently then than I am now in terms of just actually life? And what would it take for things to change for me to feel like I'm living life a little more to the fullest?
And I often was thinking about how so often we look to the future to fulfill ourselves. When, you know, am I just being miserable right now in my life? Am I miserable looking for life in the future in some sense while missing out on what Jesus has for me right now? This um, actually was brought to my mind this morning. I might reference this a couple times. Uh, we had, I had a little class with some people who want to be baptized. And um, uh, one of the intentional statements in, 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 uh, in, in baptism uh, that we do uh, it makes an allusion to this fact that God is giving us life, our eternal life, and living uh, in, in, a, in a resurrected life, in a sense, now and into eternity. And that reminded me of this question of like, what, you know, am I just miserable right now looking forward to the future or am I actually uh, living life? So the passage of Scripture that I want to look at this morning comes to us from John chapter 5. And uh, it's, a, it's a passage where Jesus is talking with, or he's trying to reason with the Jewish religious leaders in Jerusalem. He's trying to have this, this he's trying to help them understand where he's coming from. Uh, and so he had actually healed a man uh, on the Sabbath day, which was supposed to be a day of rest. And I'm not sure if this, oh, they, oh yeah, it's working, good. Okay, um, this is kind of an artist rendition of this event that Jesus was, was in. Of course, this is probably not totally accurate, but um, Jesus was, was at the pool of Bethesda, or Bethsaida, however you want to say that, and there was this guy laying there, and you know, these, all, all these people who were invalids or who couldn't walk or who, who had just different physical ailments would try to get into this pool as soon as it was um, moved or whatever. And they thought that an angel would come down and, uh, would, and they'd possibly be healed in that time if they could get in the pool first. And this guy could not get in the pool because he couldn't walk. And Jesus comes along, and he ends up, I'll just cut to the chase, he's, he heals him. Boom. He's, and he, what he tells him is, take up your mat and walk. And this is great. I mean, it ought to be great. A guy healed, and Jesus tells him, take up your mat and walk. And he does it. He takes up his mat and he walks. And then he gets stopped by, probably by this guy that's looking at Jesus over here. I think that's the the depiction there of this maybe a, a religious leader, you could say, a, a Jewish religious leader, maybe a Pharisee, maybe a scribe or somebody like that. And they stop this man and say, hey, 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 you're not supposed to be walking around with your, your mat, the, the thing that you were sleeping on. That's, that goes against the Sabbath rules. It's too much work. You're supposed to rest. God said you have to rest. You don't pick up your mat. And he's like, well, Jesus told me to, you know? And uh, they're like, uh-oh. So then they go, and they want to have this discussion with Jesus saying, hey, what do you think you're doing? Telling these people to get up and walk, and they can't see beyond the healing. They can't enjoy what's, what God is doing in their midst. They're so focused on keeping the rules. And it's understandably so. Because they viewed the rules as a way in which if, if Israel, if all the people kept the rules, then God would be good to Israel as a nation. You know? That was their thinking. And so this discussion that we're going to come in on is after this happens, and Jesus, um, he's reasoning with them. He's trying to talk with them about this. And it says in the scriptures, it says how it's unlawful for this man to pick up his mat and walk, and that Jesus uh, was being unlawful and encouraging this person to walk with his mat. And I want to make it, I want to give you kind of a, a way of looking at the unlawfulness, because they had all these rules in place for the Sabbath, 
okay? And, and really what they were were they were like guardrails. Now, guardrails are not a bad thing. It's not a bad idea to have some guardrails in your life in place, especially if you know you're prone to certain uh, tendencies or sins that uh, you want to protect yourself against. Um, they're not necessarily a bad thing. But when everybody's setting up everybody guardrails for everyone else, that's when it becomes a problem. And we become kind of this police state kind of thing. I mean, and, you know, today, I don't... I don't have to police you guys. Facebook does it for me. Um, you know, it's the great police state. It's everyone's telling everyone how they ought to act is kind of what it comes down to. And it's bothersome. It's weighty. It's a law that no one, no one can escape from. You cannot do enough good in this world, according to Facebook, at least, uh, or according to this world. We need something different. We need, we need to think about things in a different way. We need to run to somebody who can save us from these things and from our own shortcomings, um, and that is Jesus. So, they have these guardrails and these boundaries, and that is what was called, their, in their terms, the law in, in, in that way. Okay, so where was I here? I need to make sure I stick on my notes. Okay, so he does this, and then uh, the religious leaders are coming against him. And actually, in John chapter 5, verse 18, it tells us exactly what the religious leaders were thinking and why they were doing different things. And this is why the Jews, also known as the Jewish religious leaders, were seeking all the more to kill him, that is Jesus, okay? They were seeking to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, according to them, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And right before this, I believe it talks about how uh, he's, he's saying, my father is working until now, and I am working. And it's interesting. We just sang a song saying, uh, talking about how God is working. Our father is working even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, God is working. And that is awesome <laughs> because I need to be worked on. So, Jesus, after this, after this statement is made, is saying that he's, he's talking to these, these religious leaders, and he starts to reason with them about a couple of different things. He's, he's talking about his authority, where it comes from, why uh, he has the right to do what he is doing uh, in that place. And, and it's funny because when you read this, these, um, the passage uh, that Jesus is talking about. He's talking about uh, things in kind of a courtroom setting, you could say. There's words like, like judgment. There's, there's, um, and there's other words in there that allude to that. Authority. Judge. And then the next one is Witnesses. And so it's almost like he's, he's creating a courtroom kind of experience where he's saying, you guys are trying to come against me and claim that all these things are against me. Like you're trying to say, I'm doing this bad stuff and all of this. And he's saying, let's go to court. And he's starting to call witnesses. And he calls out these different people who bear witness to him or the, these different things that bear witness to him. And so I like to say he's using that language, you could say. And so what he does is he appeals to witnesses. In verse 33, he appeals to John the Baptist. One of, you know, uh, he was an interesting guy, but John the Baptist was pointing Israel to Jesus. They were saying, he was saying, look to Jesus. He is where it's at. You follow after him. In verse 36, we see that Jesus appeals to the works that he is doing, not just, well, yeah, the miraculous works. He's saying, look, these are good things that I'm doing, and, 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 and they verify who I am. And he's not just saying, like, as I think about that, it's not just the works in and of themselves, but it's how they're done. Like, you think about it, he was ministering to those who were poor, the sick, the, the outcast. Not just the outcasts, but those who were, 
who were in high places in society. He was, creating, he was, he was treating everyone the same in that sense. He was, he was, when we see that, we see that there are um, ideas of who the Messiah was going to be and what their role was in that. And we see him specifically getting at those who were outcast, ministering to those people, the people that no one else wanted to, the people that, you know, if they got healed, that's ah, no big deal. But if you get the popular guys, now that's a big deal. See, Jesus was saying, look at the works that I'm doing, not just the works that I'm doing, but how they're being done and who's getting ministered to. Let them bear witness about me and about who I am. And then we get into verse 37, which is where I'm going to start. And we see the two witnesses that Jesus uh, appeals to. One is the Father, God, the Father. And then he makes mention of the scriptures. And that's really what I want to hone in on uh, this morning. It's just going to be, I'm going to try to keep it real simple uh, as far as, like, I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but I um, kind of can't help it. Anyways, sorry, I'm rambling. What I really want to do, I want to focus in on that, the part about the scriptures, because I think it really brings to light the heart of the issue uh, that Jesus is getting at for the people he's talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the scribes. He's talking to the Jewish religious leaders, okay? It's really important to know this as we, as we read this. Um, and so we'll go right into 37 here. It says, and the Father who sent me, this is Jesus speaking now, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me, about who I am. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. I want you to think about this. This is, um, this is really important. Remember who he's talking to specifically here. He's talking to Pharisees. He's talking to scribes. These people knew the scriptures. They knew the word of God. God had given the law to Moses for his people Israel. These were the words of God. And here Jesus says, you don't, you don't know the Father. You, don't, you have never heard his voice. Think about words, language, right? You've never seen him. You do not have his word abiding in you. Wow, that's a very pointed phrase for these people. These people, the scribes and the Pharisees, they memorize the Old Testament, like whole sections of it, like the entire law, like chapters upon chapters. They would have these things memorized down to a T. They would know the scriptures in and out. And he says this, he says that they that, that, that God's word is not even abiding in them, that it's not living in them? What? And he says, because you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. And he's referring to himself. This would have been very pointed, okay? Okay. Next couple of verses get to the, the heart of it, like I was saying. It says in verse 39, he says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. This, I believe, is the heart of of. of like, Jesus could see their hearts. He could see what they were thinking. He knew what they were about. And he was getting right to the point here. He was getting right to the point. He knew what they were looking for. What were they looking for? Eternal life. They're looking, they're looking. Why? Because he knows their fears. He knows what they fear. You know, it's not just those religious leaders in that time who feared death. 
No, it's, it's the fear that comes to every human, all of humanity. Jesus gets to the why of these religious leaders uh, looking into the scriptures. Why are they looking into the scriptures? And I think it's, they're, they're looking because of, of this idea of uh, the fear of missing out, right? FOMO. Some of you guys know what that is. A bunch of you guys probably don't. These young guys know what that is. Fear of missing out. They don't want to miss out on what God has for them. And that fear of death is fueling them to look for eternal life in these scriptures. And it's, it's that fear that is dictating what they are looking for. And we all have to deal with the fear of missing out, right? Our fear of death and missing out, it drives us to do what we can to prolong our lives and try to do, you know, have a fulfilling life. Um, and it's not a bad thing. Like, it's not bad to, like, prolong your life or, like, to try to, like, to eat healthy and to exercise and all those things. But if we are living by those things, if that is the sole focus of our life to prolong our days by doing all these things that we can to do that, it will never ultimately fulfill us. And we will always fall short. How many times, you know, in the past, it's like, oh, yeah, this thing is healthy to eat. And then you find out years later, oh, that just took off five years of my life at the end of my life. You know? Like, it, wasn't, it didn't end up being healthy. You know, you're supposed to eat eggs. No, you're not supposed to eat eggs. Oh, no, you're supposed to eat eggs. And then you, yeah, you know what I mean. We will always fall short of what we're supposed to, to do in those ways. Jesus appeals to the religious leaders to come to him that they might have life. You know, I often read these passages like Jesus is angry with them. And I've had this discussion with Mike just a little bit about Jesus' anger. I, I don't know that I, I see that here. I see more of his compassionate side in the way verse 40 is. This thing of like, would you guys just come to me? I want to give you life. And they refuse to. I see it breaking his heart that they can't just enjoy the moment where this guy was healed and like who cares if he's, he's carrying his mat around on the Sabbath day. It's going to be okay. Rejoice in the, the work that's happening, the, the thing that's happening. So he's appealing to them that they might have life. And notice, I, I thought this was interesting. You start, you know, really analyzing these verses. And I was like, man, it's interesting that he says that he's, he's pointing to them. He's saying, you're searching the scriptures for eternal life. And then he says, but they bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life, not eternal life. He doesn't say eternal life, he says life. Jesus is the creator. He is the word. John 1 says, he's the word that gives life. You know, when, when God spoke everything into being, it's like Jesus was the word. He was the, the one that brought it all together. It all came out of, out of him. I like to think of it as like kind of this like... Um, I don't know, nuclear reactor or something. Something that just like, except for nuclear, you have waste and stuff, so that's not that great. But um, something that just has so much energy, unstoppable energy. I think about, um, I can't help but say, but think about, um, like, I, I wonder if that's what the new heaven and new earth is going to be like, where it's like, you know, in the springtime when the flowers are coming up and they, you just can't stop it, or the weeds are coming up and you can't stop it. It's like life is just bubbling up and out and then it's coming, coming. You can't stop it. You can spray as much Roundup as you want, but it just keeps coming. Jesus is like, you know, he's, 
He's like the force that keeps every living thing continually growing and, and, and creating and, 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 and that kind of thing. He's the originator of life itself in that sense. If you have life, if you've got the generator of life, you don't have to worry about eternal life. If the generator of life is living in you, you don't have to worry about eternal life. What are you seeking? What are you looking to to give you life? It's interesting, the uh, Greek word here for uh, life that is used there in verse 40 is zoe or zoe or something. And, um, and what's interesting when you look at it, it's, it has, uh, it's more about the quality of life, you could say, or this energizing life. But still within that is this aspect of eternal life. There's, but it's more of a side note. It's not the focus. It's not the focus. Jesus is saying, come to me that you can have life. You're already dead. Okay, so we want Zoe. We want what Jesus is giving. And Jesus is saying, you're looking in the wrong place to give you life. And I, I do want to say this about the scriptures because it could be, you could be like, oh, well, then I won't read the scriptures. No. The scriptures are so important. Okay? They are unique. They are uh, the God's special revelation given to us. They're given, I believe, as a gift to us. I'm so thankful for these words here. And I believe they are sufficient. However, I also know people who have read the Bible. People who have studied the Bible. There are many biblical scholars out there who have read it and studied it, and yet they do not believe. They have not come to Jesus. They fall short of that for some reason. Their lives have not been transformed by God. We want to remember that the scriptures are there to point us to Jesus. Remember the the guys walking on the road to Emmaus? They knew the scriptures. They even walked with Jesus when he was there. And yet, they didn't even, they were all somber. And then what? Jesus all of a sudden like reveals to them. And they're like, our hearts were burning in us. And like he was explaining the scriptures and how they point to Jesus. And it was Jesus. They missed out. They didn't even realize it was happening. And they were like, oh, Wow, it wasn't until they actually met Jesus that they had that life that was just like bubbling out and they just were revolutionary changed. I mean, it was crazy. They point us to Jesus. The scriptures point us to Jesus. Who is the center of our trust and our faith? Jesus is the center of our trust and our faith. I trust the scriptures, yes, but more so I trust in Jesus Christ. This morning, as part of the baptism class, I was talking about how Jesus is the most important thing. We put our faith and our trust in Jesus, and everything else comes out of that. We don't let the world, we don't let our opinions, we don't let all these other things determine for us who Jesus is. We look to Jesus as the originator, and from there, that's how we interpret uh, everything. We interpret our doctrine, we, imp- we interpret our opinions, our church life, our lives, everything. That's at least how it ought to be. Jesus is the center. He's the focus. He is the one who gives life, and it, our faith is in him. So my question is, what or who are you relying on to give you the zoe, or the life, that is fulfilling? Are we looking to go back to the way things were? You know? Pre-COVID. Oh, yeah, once I get all these regulations off, then I'm going to be living the life. Really? Are we relying on the next cool trend to come along to bring us into that life, the next cool style, you know, 
next cool hobby? Are we relying on the next job, the next big break? Pay raise? The next time off, vacation? You know, that's going to give me life, yeah. You know, all these things are good things. I don't want to deny that. It's nice to get a pay raise. It's nice to be able to have time off. It's nice when you get that break or when you finally uh, ask the girl out and she says yes, right? All those things are great. But if we're relying on those things to fulfill us and to bring us into life, we will end up deeply disappointed. And it's the same problem whether it was before COVID or after, okay? Or we can choose to view it in a different way and allow God to reveal it in a different way in our lives. And that is that we can allow all of these good things to point us to Jesus. Kind of like the scriptures. I mean, it's a little different. Scriptures are unique. But we, do we allow our situations to point us to Jesus? Do we see Jesus working through all of these things in our lives to bring us to him? And they work in different ways, you know? As we go into the summer, I, I encourage you to reflect on what it is that you are desiring, what it is that you really want, what it is that you are uh, looking to to fulfill your life. Just take a moment and think about it. Just stop your life and say, you know what, what am I thinking about? What am I looking for? What am I looking to to fulfill my life and to give me my life? And I encourage you just to hang in there and change the way that you view your life in view of Jesus being your fulfillment. And that how your lifestyle or whatever it is you're looking at, how it can reveal your need for Jesus. How it can reveal the blessing of Jesus on your life. How it reveals the love of Jesus on your life. How the things that you're living out in your lifestyle, how it reveals even the judgment of Jesus. Revealing the mercy of Jesus, revealing the grace of Jesus. All of these things, when we, when we focus on these, and when we look at our faith being foundationed on Jesus, then a lot of times it brings about the thankfulness. We look back and we say, wow, I'm so thankful for God. And it brings to light just how awesome and how wonderful Jesus is. Are you in awe of Jesus? Is he your life? Will you come to him that you may have life? And you don't have to worry about eternal life. He's got it covered. Would you stand with me and would the worship team come up? As we go into this next song, I just want to uh, encourage you to submit your life to Jesus, to follow after him. Is he what you desire, who you desire? Or is it just looking to the future, trying to live your life as, you know, just get through all this miserable sense because it's going to all be better in the future. Well, guess what? He's here to give you life now and forever. What is it that you're looking forward to? What is it that you're looking to fulfill your life in this next stage um, of life in this summer, in this next year? And I encourage you, if, when he says, come to me, you can come to him right now. You can pray. You can turn your heart to him. And remember, he came for you, he died for you, he died so that you might have life. He rose again so that we might identify with him in, in his resurrection, and someday we will too uh, be resurrected. But we will not die. We will always be with him. Are you looking to him for life? Sing a song, and I'll finish up. Let 
were dead in the trespasses and sins in once in what in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all lived in the passions of the flesh carrying out our desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Go in peace and in the power of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>